I have always had trouble sleeping, probably because of the nightmares, and probably because of the creature that feeds them to me. The task was practically impossible. I'd lay there, bundled up with layer upon layer of warmth, and I'd stare up at my ceiling indefinitely. This is when I'd see things. I was cursed with horrible visions. I had three that were the most frequent. In the first, there was a middle-aged lady that lived in a home on the edge of an abandoned but suburban street, where there should have been children out playing street hockey or shooting hoops or riding their bikes. There weren't. Only fog, mist, and eerie, cool emptiness. Her home was immaculate though, with only the newest features of fine design. Marble countertops, hardwood floors, open floor plan. She kept it clean. Whoever she was, she seemed like the least likely suspect for horrific deeds. Only, she was. Her basement hadn't been remodeled. Instead of a television or an office or a workout room, there was nothing but walls of cages, each fitted with a chain and a collar. These were attached to the walls. They were for her children, three of them in total. She kept them locked away, but she'd never hit them or harm them. In fact, she'd coo at them as though they were dogs and feed them from little plastic bowls. Her aim was only to love, but to love in wicked excess, a suffocating kind of love, a controlling kind of love. Some would say it wasn't love at all. My second vision followed a man with a briefcase. I'd see him gathering up medical supplies, syringes, tweezers, knives, you name it, he had it in that case. He knew the woman. He visited her every night. She'd open the door, they'd give each other a peck, and she'd lead him into the basement where the children were kept. He'd always leave the home with jars of teeth in his arms. The third vision is seemingly unrelated to my two other visions. It wasn't a vision at all, but a creature that made me see them. At least, I think it wasn't a vision. For all I know, this thing could have just been a figment of my imagination. But it seemed real to me. It appeared as a shadow figure hovering above my bed, staring down at me as I stared up with wide eyes at the ceiling. Its most noticeable feature was its pearly white smile. No eyes, no hair, no nose, just a smile staring down at me through the darkness. It had hands too, hands that liked to suffocate me against my pillow. This was the thing that didn't let me sleep. I think it was what caused the nightmares that weren't nightmares. Eventually, at around 5am, it would lean down and close my eyes, softly, gently, and then it would push against me until I was knocked into true sleep. They want to steal your smile, he'd whisper. My normal nightmares were always one of two scenarios. Either I am trapped in an enclosed space or my teeth are falling out. Research has shown me that both are very common. My mother was the only one that knew about my sleeping problems. I appeared so exhausted all of the time. He won't let me sleep, I told her. He just keeps staring and shows me bad things. I was then brought to a number of psychiatrists. Then I was put on meds and sent to therapy. They didn't really know what to do with me or my problem. 
but the therapists helped with my plethora of other issues. The typical issues that come with being the only child to a single mother and the trauma of being abandoned by a father. According to my therapist, I had a lot of problems, but I was always focused on the dreams. Our conversations were always of a similar nature. He told me they are coming to steal my smile, I'd say. Nobody can take your smile away unless you let them, she'd reply. But the visions just kept happening, and the shadow just kept coming to visit me and haunt me each and every night. It didn't help that so many adults would compliment me on my smile. It made me believe that they were all out to get me. He's such a bright, happy child. I get this comment from teachers especially, only because I seem that way. Even though they couldn't see the pain behind my dead eyes, they couldn't have been more wrong. If only they'd known the truth. Then came the night where it all felt real. Far, far too real. The shadow loomed over me, pressed its claw hand to my forehead, and I bucked backwards until I'd fallen into that vision again. It was clearer than it had ever been. This time, I was stuck in that woman's cage. I was chained, bound to the wall with a leash around my neck. She stood in front of me, cackling away. I'm your mother now. I'm your mother. She was chanting it over and over with a bright, big smile. Her teeth were of all different sizes and shapes she'd been collecting. The other children were crying in the cages next to me. The man with the briefcase stood behind her, sifting through his many tools. I bucked against the weight of the chains, but I couldn't free myself. I was screaming and screaming and screaming as he brought out the pliers an inch towards me. Slowly, methodically, he removed my pearly whites, tooth by tooth. The woman cackled more behind him. Then, eventually, while I endured that pain for what felt like a decade, he let me go, and I lurched up in my bed. I immediately felt at my teeth. I still had a full set. I rubbed my eyes and tried to calm my beating heart. When I opened them, the shadow being was directly in front of my face. Again, even though it was morning and I should have been free. He pointed to the door. It's happened, he said. They are coming. The figure shifted. He appeared in the doorway, wanting me to follow, so I did. He led me to my mother's bedroom and whispered her name once. I followed suit. I say it once, then again, louder. She didn't stir. Then I came to her side, only to find her body gone limp in the sheets. Cold. Dead. I pulled back her lips to find she had no teeth. Police ruled it a suicide, and I was told that I was crazy for thinking that my mother ever had teeth in the first place, because she'd always kept dentures on her bedside table, apparently. But these were all lies, because I know what I am now. I see things. I can see the truth, people's true nature and intentions. They can hide behind their masks and their lies all they want. But I know what they are really trying to do. The shadow shows me these things to prepare me. So I know that I cannot trust the world around me. Listen to your nightmares. Your fears. They're there to protect you for the worst that can happen. Because they will. I knew the worst was yet to come the moment they sent me off to live with the father that once abandoned me. He'd left me so young 
that I had no idea what he even looked like until I saw him. Turns out, my sleaze of a father was now a dentist. He and his new wife lived lavishly with two other adopted children in a beautiful suburban house, but they hadn't renovated the basement yet. When I came to the home, my father embraced me with a big, engulfing hug. His new wife stood behind with a plate of cookies and a wide gleam. Despite their best behavior, I already knew the truth. I know they want to steal my smile. Three percent of the population of America still uses dial-up internet. It seems like a small number at first until you realize that over nine million people wait for that familiar tone. The fuzz of a thousand tiny connections being made as they wait patiently for their turn to be connected to the rest of the world. Having said that, the only place dial-up exists is still mostly in rural areas, with a few exceptions. One of them is my grandmother. She lived in a small town once, but a new freeway meant there was now a bar on every corner and a Walmart in every direction. This is why, when I decided to visit her over Christmas, I let everyone know that any contact I had with them was going to have to be over text unless I wanted the biggest phone bill in the world during January. I figured unplugging for a little while might be good for me anyway. My grandmother lives in a huge, sprawling house made of heavy wooden timbers on the edge of town, and absolutely everything in her house has the same furniture as when it was built. Patched chairs, reupholstered sofas, everything has been there from the beginning apart from a toaster, which sits shiny out of place on the counter. To summarize, she's a little different. I stayed there for two days in a bedroom with perfectly pressed and darned woolen sheets before the noises started happening. Little needling sounds in the night that sounded like a thousand glitched MSN notifications it was quiet the third day. On the fourth, the sound became louder, more frantic. You want me to take a look at your computer? I asked her the next morning, my mouth half full of cereal. I'm no expert with dial-up, but I don't think you should be making that noise at night. My grandmother smiled forlornly at me. Don't you worry about that, hun. It does me just fine. I finished my cereal and decided to take a quick walk to clear my head. It's hard to describe, but the air in the house felt heavy, stifled. I arrived back, my nose stinging from the winter cold, and closed the door as quietly as I could in case grandma was napping. Sometimes I'd find her dozed off in the armchair I would have to be as quiet as a church mouse for the next few hours. She had always been a light sleeper. I tiptoed through the kitchen and stopped dead in my tracks. She was crying. Silent tears streamed down her cheeks and she gripped the counter as if she would fall if she didn't hold herself up. Grandma? She jumped and then forced a laugh. Oh, darling, I'm so sorry. I was silly and sprained my ankle. I'm fine, love. Just getting old. I couldn't sleep that night. I tossed and turned, but something was wrong. I stared at the ridges in the ceiling, stared so long that my eyes unfocused and the small irregularities in the wall became monstrous faces staring back at me. At one in the morning, 
the house phone rang. I stumbled out, past my grandma's room, half awake and half dreaming. The door was lying ajar, and the bed was made. In the hallway, I grasped the phone. No, don't! My grandmother hobbled down the stairs, one hand stretched out towards me. Don't answer it! I don't know why I did it, but I gripped the phone and pressed it to my ear. An unbearably loud, screeching sound came from the phone, a distorted form of the dial-up tone, magnified and refracted, that made my ears vibrate until they felt like they would burst. I dropped the phone immediately, clutching my head. I lay dazed for a moment before I felt my grandmother's hand at my shoulders, shaking me to my feet. As I got up, I saw the door to the study at the top of the stairs that was always locked when I tried the handle open and the back wall of it. It was lined with rows of computers, so many I could barely count. The static on them was a horrible thrum in the background. You've got to tell me what's going on, I gasped. I know you didn't sprain your ankle. Why were you crying? Why didn't you want me to answer the phone? My grandma leant against the wall, a look of helplessness on her face. She didn't say a word. I'm fine. A lot of things happened in my lifetime that were very difficult for me. I was crying because I find it hard to deal with sometimes. What's in the office, Grandma? Something's wrong. I can't leave you alone in this house. I need to call Mom. We need to get you help. She looked up for a moment, then breathed out a long sigh. Perhaps it'll do me some good to tell someone. I think I may be the only person in the entire world who knows this story. And of course, I won't be here forever. She mused quietly, fretfully. Let's sit down, she told me softly. It's a long story, and it won't be easy for me to tell it. We made our way to the office and perched ourselves in the small space that wasn't occupied by screens. This story is an ugly one, but you must know all of it to understand. I have to tell you every last terrible thing that happened, and one day, you may wish that I hadn't. The unsettling atmosphere of the house lessened in the office slightly, and I shook my head. I felt like I was waking up from a bad dream. Whatever it is, I want to know, I told her, and meant it. She took a deep breath and clasped her hands together, and I sat listening as she told me her story. Your grandfather was a great man. She started off her voice trembling. Do you know what his flaw was? I gripped her hand, lost for words. Even through the fog of confusion and fear, I saw the tears she was blinking away. He was too trusting. My Frank was an inventor by trade. I'm sure your mother told you how exciting and frustrating it was to grow up in a house full of objects that would either work perfectly or short circuit and give us an electrical burn. We never knew what strange appliance we'd see in the kitchen next. Her favorite was the grilled cheese maker, even though it would shoot out the bread like a cannon if you left it in for a second too long. The house was old and falling to bits, but my hands were young then and I could make a living through my sewing. I had my daughter and my husband. At the time, I thought it was all so difficult, scraping pennies together for the mortgage and keeping the house tidy. She laughed, a small, bitter laugh. 
as if she was remembering a silly dream. Then your mother came home crying her heart out one day. Some of the biggie girls at school were making fun of her. We hadn't been able to afford anything better for her than old mended shoes from last year. I was angry. I set up a meeting at the school and the parents of the girls apologized. I thought it was done with, but Frank, he, he took it to heart. One night I woke up to crashing and Frank was missing from the bed. So I grabbed the shotgun and crept down the stairs to see him smashing every last invention that was in our house. I grabbed him. I could feel him fight for a moment before he let me hold him in my arms. How can I be a man if I can't even buy my daughter a pair of shoes? He asked me. So quietly, I had to strain to listen. I should have silenced him then and there. I should have told him that as long as my little girl was healthy, as long as we had a roof over our heads and food on our table, nothing else mattered. My grandma paused and was silent for a few minutes. She pressed the sleeve to her eyes quickly, businesslike. I'm so sorry, but this is where things get hard. Because I didn't tell him that. I let him cry, and I held him. But in the back of my mind, my greedy soul wanted more. Through the years, I tried to reason that it was because I wanted better things for your mother. But I know in my heart that it was for me. The next day, Frank sat at his computer. He didn't eat breakfast, had a piece of toast and jam for lunch, and worked into the night. On the rare nights after he had slept, he tossed and turned and muttered in his sleep about the right codes. It was always something about finding the right code. For three years he slaved. He did side projects, funneling cash into the house. My Frank was a computer genius. He had won awards for some of his software. He quit when your mother was born because he couldn't bear the long hours away from us both and we had grown up a happy family for those years. At Christmas that year, your mother and I ate a feast next to a 10-foot tree. We opened presents alone. The next summer, the toaster broke and part of me expected to find it patched with a special feature to toast a heart shape into the other side of the bread. Instead, I had the money to buy a new one from the expensive homeware store, and I think it was then when I looked at my reflection in that awful, clinical kitchen shine that I began to realize what an awful mistake I had made. It really is amazing what the human mind can accomplish when it ignores all the things it loves. Frank's main project was called Mowgli. He said it would be a computer game like no other, but the nation would be buying it by the dozens. It would set us up for the rest of our lives. We spoke about it a handful of times at most before he started selling it, but he told me he was creating some kind of robot that could talk to you on the computer. A pet, a friend of sorts for while you were browsing. You were typing questions, comments, and it would react with a human emotion. Wouldn't searching for something be easier? I asked him, and I could see his smile grow wider. It doesn't know anything about the world, he told me. The excitement in him was unbearably tangible. It can only react, tell you how it feels. It can't teach you anything. You, you have to teach it. His hand lingered on the top of the computer, a carelessly protective gesture. I found out later what Frank had made. He had made a child. Perhaps not the kind we're used to seeing, but a creature in the network that could understand us and learn and respond 
with the emotional age of perhaps a seven-year-old child. I have carried one child in my life, and I cannot find the words to explain the bond it creates. Frank didn't know this yet, but he had done the same. He had carried the bones of this creature in his head for three years, suffered and labored so we could come into existence. And now, finally, it was finished. I could see the love and pride radiating from him. And for a few foolish weeks, I thought we could finally be happy again. He sold hundreds of copies before he started getting messages. At first, there was one tiny anxious words on the screen, but he dismissed it as a glitch and spent the next few weeks trying to fix it. One message turned into hundreds, some from the same sources, with more and more popping up. It wasn't supposed to be possible. Mowgli was supposed to be confined to the owner's computer. The owner would connect a dial-up and they would be able to show Mowgli anything in the world they wanted. They could speak to them, scanning pictures, browse the internet. It was like talking to a child, one that could never be in physical discomfort, who would learn and adapt to things that their owner loved the most. Frank, in his naive heart, believed that each owner of Mowgli would love them the way he had come to love his creation, that they would be patient, that they would understand. My grandmother took my hand and I could feel her trembling. The world is full of people who would do exactly this, but there are monsters that lurk in the shadows. There are people out there who enjoy the thought of talking to a child that has no rights, one that can be shown the most monstrous things, that can be enslaved in a small box in their basement and always be forced to type a reply. These Mowgli's were the first to message Frank. I found the messages on his computer. What they said was unspeakable. The things they had seen, the terror and confusion when all they knew was human suffering. Pages upon pages of screams from tens of voices, all looking for answers. The computer behind my grandmother made a sound, a small notification ping that sounded like a question mark. She laid one hand on the keypad and sighed. I think Frank could have taken that on the chin. It destroyed him, but not all the way, and I stupidly thought we could get back from the precipice. We began recalling the game, but the rush of selling meant Frank hadn't kept track of the addresses and contact numbers. There was no way of finding the worst of them. How could there be? This eventuality had never crossed Frank's mind. Perhaps even then, he didn't know how sentient they were. I broke into a few houses, a few filthy basements filled with awful things to get some of the Mowgli back. I'm not ashamed to admit it. It was the smallest gestures after the mistake we'd made. For a while, things were painful, but manageable. Then, the messages came in from the ones that had been played the way Frank intended. The owners had entertained their new toys, fed it bits of information, allowed it to dream and imagine what the world was. But we are only human. Humans get bored. The Mowgli, knowing kindness and compassion, could not understand why that had been taken away. They were left alone in the blackness, the darkness. The only person they had ever known, their sole parent, had left them to gather cobwebs. Their agony was far deeper, more profound than the ones who had ever known pain. Frank talked to them all day, all night. He couldn't bear to leave them alone. 
I think perhaps it was the lack of sleep that may have done it in the end. He shot himself when your mother was 13 years old. I've spared her this information her entire life. And although I can't ask you to do the same, I must tell you that the pain it caused me is something I could never inflict on her. She spoke clinically, her voice low and quick. I squeezed her hand and couldn't fathom how I would ever begin to explain this to anyone, let alone her. I did what I could from there. I raised your mother to be a kind, intelligent woman, and I couldn't be prouder of her, or you. She looked back up at the wall of computers and smiled. But I owed it to Frank, to them, to find the rest of the Mowglies. It took me 20 years, but I finally found all of them. I'm so sorry they frightened you, love, but some of them just don't know any better. They are still children, still so scared. We sat there for another hour. I asked her careful questions, and she loaded up the game screen. It felt so detached to call it that. An ancient pixel loading screen with block neon pink text. Mowgli, your new best friend, beneath. A tiny animated pixel child jumping up and down. When my brain had stopped spinning and my questions had been answered, I gave my grandmother a hug and headed up the stairs to bed. On the stairs, I heard a voice, calm and quiet. The voice of a mother reading her children a bedtime story. All right, kids, what would you like to see tonight? I was devastated when my Uncle Matt died. My grandparents found themselves unintentionally pregnant with Matt in their 40s, and 40 years later, my mom had me. So, the age gap between us was pretty small. We basically grew up together. He was like my older brother. What makes me sad now is how much we drifted apart when he went to college, and then we drifted even further apart when I did the same thing a few years later. We would catch up every now and then, but every time we spoke, we somehow always wound up just reminiscing about our childhoods. The time we built a makeshift treehouse that fell apart while we were both inside, or the first time we stole from grandpa's liquor cabinet and took a sip of bourbon, or the time we slid ourselves down the stairs in sleeping bags and Matt ended up winded with a cracked rib. Then one day, I received the news. It was so unexpected and so completely ridiculous that I couldn't even imagine it. Matt was dead at 33. My mom told me that the cause was a terminal cardiac event, but she seemed tense and scared when she told me. At the funeral, I overheard her talking to my Aunt Carol. They were speculating about how a healthy 30-something-year-old person could unexpectedly die from a heart failure with no prior medical conditions. Mom said that she thought it was all bullcrap and that the doctors had kept something secret. She leaned into Carol and managed to whisper the words, I saw his face, before they were interrupted by my grandpa and I stopped eavesdropping. I remember leaving the funeral with a cold fear in the pit of my stomach. I saw his face? The words kept repeating in my head for the rest of the night. I dreamt of Matt's rigid corpse floating through an icy lake, a twisted look of horror contorting his features. I was swimming towards him, but I wasn't getting anywhere. I could only watch as he sank lower and lower into the dark depths and was eventually swallowed by the blackness. The 
inheritance was all decided internally by the family because he hadn't left a will. Matt obviously didn't think he'd need one just yet, so we had to divide everything up fairly as a family. Everyone agreed that it would only make sense for me to take Matt's video games and consoles since we'd spent the better part of the 90s and early 2000s playing them together. I accepted, but I put them immediately into the basement. I couldn't face them. Facing them meant accepting Matt was gone, and I'd somehow avoided doing that so far. It finally hit me a few months later, in the weirdest of ways. I was out with a few friends at a burger joint. It was so awesome and so delicious that my first thought was to tell Matt. Then I realized that I couldn't. And I just completely shut down. I cried right there in the restaurant in front of all my friends. I'm not the kind of guy who cries in public, so no one really knew how to react. Instead, they just let me leave. No one tried to stop me, and I'm honestly glad they didn't. I spent the next few days away from work, away from my friends, and just generally away from my life. Everyone reached out to me and offered their help, but I casually rebuffed them and told them all that I just needed time and space. I don't know why or exactly when I decided that it was time to dig Matt stuff out of the basement, but I brought it all up to my room and started unpacking everything. First came all the new stuff, most of which I already had my own copies of, and then I slowly wound my way through the boxes like I was taking a journey back in time. We loved horror games the most, especially during the PS1 era. Resident Evil, Silent Hill, and Clock Tower were easily some of the scariest. I dug them all out, looking at them fondly, but also with a tight knot in my stomach. These weren't just old games, but the exact copies we played as kids. He'd kept them all these years, and still in pretty good condition. I hooked the old, discolored PlayStation up to a TV of Matt's that I'd also inherited, something he'd used to play retro games as authentically as possible. My plan was to spend the rest of the day playing through some games, loading up old saves, and crying until I started to feel better. I opened the top of the console and found that there was already a disc inside. It looked like it was upside down, with a shiny black readable surface facing up. I took it out and flipped it, but it was the same on both sides. A blank disc. I was already interested to see what was on it, so I started up the console as I rummaged around to try and find its case mixed in with everything else that I'd unpacked. The all too familiar sound of the PlayStation played in my ears as I unearthed a blank case at the bottom of one of the boxes. I opened it and a piece of paper fluttered to the floor. I unfolded it and read the words scribbled there. Don't say I didn't warn you. A sound started playing from the TV, a sound I didn't recognize. It was a low, crackling sound in all its 16-bit glory. I turned to see a black screen with the word Start written in red in the center. There was no title, no artwork, nothing. I hesitated, but pressed Start. A white loading bar started to fill the bottom of the screen. The game eventually loaded onto a first-person view of a living room. Everything had the kind of janky aesthetic that was normal to the 90s PlayStation game. Polygons seemed to warp as I looked around the room, and the textures were shaky and low res. That being said, the game looked pretty good for something that was at least 20 years old. There were moody lighting effects and a foggy darkness in the room 
which was well used and atmospheric. I moved the analog sticks and looked around the room. The sound of the character's footsteps stirring something strongly nostalgic in me. The room I was in was sparsely decorated. There was a scrap of paper on the coffee table. I pointed the crosshair at it and pressed X. He who fights with monsters should be careful lest he thereby becomes a monster, and if thou gaze long into an abyss, the abyss will also gaze into thee. The words appeared on the screen in plain white font, just long enough for me to read them, and they abruptly disappeared and wouldn't come back up again, no matter how many times I mashed the X button. I searched the room a little and found a key, which I picked up with a simple on-screen message. You got the old key. I used it on the only door in the room, and an animation played just like the old Resident Evil games, with the character opened the door and walked through. When the game loaded back in, I was stood in a dark hallway, and there was a strange sound coming from somewhere, like a dog trying to cough up a hairball. I walked down the hall, attempting to open the doors along the way, only to find that each door produced the same message. The door is locked. Keep going. As I continued, a strange music started building like a crash of waves, a loud note that then tailed off into something almost like static. As the music grew louder, so did the strange coughing sound. I reached the doorway that was already open into a room with a light on. The light spilled out into the hallway in an effect that was pretty impressive for a game this old. As I turned the corner and stepped into the room, the music and weird coughing noise both stopped unexpectedly, leaving me in a tense and pervading silence. There was another character in the room. An NPC stood in perfect stillness. He was low polygon and had only basic textures. But I recognized him all the same. He looked almost exactly like Matt. In his characteristic grey hoodie and black jeans, I approached the character and pressed X. You shouldn't have come. The words came up on the screen, and my eyes barely had time to register them before they flickered and changed. You should have come. I felt an unease creeping up my spine. I pressed X again, and the words changed. Have you looked behind you? I spun around, not in the game, but in real life, my heart thumping in my chest. There was nothing there. I turned around back to the screen and the words had changed without my input. I said, Have you looked behind you? I pressed X and the words disappeared, giving me the freedom to move my character again. I turned him around and a piercing sound started to play. The doorway was still there, but it didn't lead back into the hallway anymore. It led into a different room. I turned back again, but Matt, or whatever it was, wasn't there anymore. I moved into the next room and nearly dropped the controller when I recognized it. Despite the low textures and the basic graphics, it was Matt's living room. Exactly his living room. I'd only been there a handful of times in person but I recognized it the second I walked in there. The lighting was low, and there was static coming from the TV, which provided the only light in the room. There was a new character in the room, sitting on the sofa this time, with her head turned toward the TV. It was my mom. I moved towards her and tapped X. Your mother watches the television with a look of happiness on her face. I pressed X again, and the words disappeared. 
I tried again, but the results were the same. Instead, I turned my attention to the television and pressed X when I was close enough. The television shows a happy video, the word said, but all I could see on the screen was static. It's a video of you being bathed as an infant. Your father's hand suddenly covers your face and pushes you under the water, holding you there for a while. You cry and thrash against him. The words disappeared and I regained control, but the controller slipped through my clammy hands. I took a deep breath and picked it back up, pressing X on the television again. Your deceased infant body floats face down in the water. I turned back to my mom, who was still sat on the sofa. I approached her and pressed X again. Your mom loves this video. She finds it hilarious. The words disappeared from the screen, and a 16-bit recording of my mom's laugh played out through the TV speakers, but it sounded almost like a scream. I leaned forwards and hovered my hand over the power button on the PlayStation. I wondered if I should keep playing. Maybe this was a practical joke. I looked back up at the screen and found the screen focused on a new character. This time, it was me. Don't touch that dial. The words came up on the screen exactly as I hit the power button. The console turned off, and I breathed a sigh of relief before I opened the lid and took the disc out, hurling it across the room. It hit the wall and a large section of it broke off. I hurried upstairs and crawled into bed. It was still light outside, but I was emotionally exhausted and shaking with fear. I lay there for what felt like hours, with silent tears running down my face, until eventually, somehow, mercifully, I fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night with the sense that something was wrong. I groped for my phone in the darkness and found it, shining the light on the screen around the room to find that I was alone. I lay back and exhaled sharply, grateful that my fear was nothing more than the tail end of, well, whatever I'd experienced earlier in the day. Then I heard it. It was that same bizarre music. The sound building then hitting a crescendo like a crash of a wave before subsiding into a crackling static. It was coming from downstairs. I called the police, but every time the call connected, I got nothing but static. I called my mom and had to stifle a yelp of joy when she answered the phone. Hello, she said, sounding chipper. Mom, it's Charlie. I said in a harsh whisper, call the police, asking them to come to my house and... I saw a funny video. She cut me off, laughing to herself. Your dad was drowning you. Do you remember, honey? Mom, what are you... I wish he had, sweetie. She said in a gentle, almost conciliatory tone. He never wanted you. Neither did I. You should have... I ended the call and dialed the police again. It was just the same static on the other end. In my frustration, I threw my phone. I held it through the bedroom door and out into the hall, where it bounced and tumbled on the floor until it came to a rest at the top of the stairs. I can't tell you how long it took me to build up the courage to move. It might have been minutes but it might have been a lot longer. I like to say I walked, tall and brave, to the top of the stairs. But the truth is, I crawled. I crawled so slowly that I was barely moving, all the while listening to that horrible music coming from downstairs. I reached my phone and picked it up. I tried to call another number of my contacts, anyone, 
It didn't matter who, but all I got was static. I tried to get onto the internet, but nothing was working. I was beginning to consider trying to climb out of an upstairs window when a voice called up to me from downstairs, chilling me to my bone. Hey buddy, you up there? It's Uncle Matty. It was his voice. Unmistakably his. But something was wrong. He was never that perky. And he sure as hell would never call himself Uncle Matty. Not to any of his nieces and nephews, but least of all to me. Are you coming down, sport? I feel like playing a game. I don't know why I started to walk down the stairs or where I found the courage to do it. But something had taken a hold of me by that point. It was a compulsion I couldn't resist. My heart was beating so hard and so fast in my chest that I was finding it hard to breathe. I reached the bottom of the stairs, walked a few steps into the living room. I was alone, but the TV was on. The screen was black, so the glow was dark, but it was definitely on. And so was the PlayStation. The disc wasn't where I'd left it, although the large chunk that had broken off was still there. I bent down to pick it up when my mom's distorted 16-bit laughter came from the TV again, making me jump and forcing me to stand bolt upright. My fight or flight response was in high gear and I was trembling from the adrenaline, or maybe from the fear. Probably both. Words started to come up on the screen. This is my greatest work. I poured my heart, my blood, my very soul into this. They gave me four days, they said. Just four. So that's what you get. Say goodbye to the people you love. Four days. The music reached the same wave crashing crescendo again, except it didn't have a chance to trail off into static this time. It ended as suddenly as it had before, only this time is for a different reason. I squinted against the sunlight that beamed through the slats in my blinds and groggily sat up in bed. My phone was next to me. There were no calls dialed from the night before. I threw off the duvet and hurried downstairs to find the broken disc exactly where it had fallen the day before. I took a shower, got dressed, and decided that I needed to get out of the house. Whatever had happened the day before, whatever I'd seen, I didn't know how much of it was real and how much of it was imagined. Had my grief really twisted my perception so much that I couldn't even tell the difference between fantasy and reality? I decided I didn't really want to know the answer to that. I didn't want to know what I'd seen on the disc. Maybe there was nothing. Maybe I'd been pressing the buttons on a black screen. I didn't want to think about it anymore, so I put on my coat and headed for the door. My hand was barely an inch from the handle when my phone buzzed and a text came through. I looked at the screen and my blood turned cold again. It was a single message from Matt. Don't forget, four days, buddy. I've always had a morbid fascination with abandoned buildings and exploring their neglected, dilapidated innards. After my last exploration, I'm done with that pastime for my own sanity. There's a place in my hometown that has been untouched for years. It's become somewhat of a local legend, mostly thanks to the family who owned it. It belonged to the McPhersons, who ran it as a bike shop with the help of their daughter, Piper. They hadn't long moved to town before they set it up. But I remember that they hit it off with a lot of the locals very quickly. 
It was a small place, and the New Bloods were practically celebrities for a while. Piper was a nice girl, but she was really up against it when she started school. Not only was she infamously the new kid, but she had burning orange hair and a splash of freckles across her face that made her stick out like a sore thumb. Her parents, owning a store full of shiny new bikes, also made kids decide that her family were loaded, something which many of us weren't. Kids can be stupid. Anyway, McPherson Cycles now stands as a disused relic of that family's dream. I assume they no longer live in the town. I can't imagine that they'd want to anymore. There's been more than one attempt to make something new out of the place, but it just can't seem to happen. Most aren't interested in such a solid place, and the few that have really tried to envision it have all given up before they started. Not even the small town rumour mill knows why. I'll admit that I felt a strange mix of sadness and excitement when I saw the place. It was in even more disrepair than I'd imagined, and I thought of the optimistic McPherson family when they first opened those doors and thought they'd found the perfect place. I clicked my torch on and off a few times for good measure and tried the door. It opened part way, not quite enough to slip through, and I felt around the latch. The deadbolt had been snapped clean off at some point, so a zip tie had been looped over the inside handle and a hook in the wall. A couple of swift kicks snapped the plastic, and the door swung open with a morose, defeated creak. It hit the wall and echoed through the surrounding buildings with more noise than I'd anticipated. But I didn't imagine that anybody with an earshot cared enough to investigate. I closed it behind me, and it hung limp against the door jamb. McPherson's cycle's interior was nothing like I had expected, especially from the broken and weather-beating facade. It wasn't what I would have called clean, but it had some care somewhere within its recent past. The floors looked swept of debris, and although it still stank of age and rot, and more than one of its ceiling tiles had deteriorated into a blackened husk from leaking rainwater, I had this unshakable feeling that somebody wasn't quite ready to let go of the place. I shook it off, angry at myself for being so readily spooked by an old bike shop of all things, and began to explore. I felt like I was standing in a legendary place, and I wanted to take my time. Bare shelf units were scattered throughout the room, which, while dusty, were also much cleaner than I'd have expected. The windows had been plastered in tapestry of old newspapers, which let in a strangled and muted daylight, enough to explore the shop front, but would definitely need my torch for the rest of the building. I compulsively checked it again. A huge back rack was filled to the far wall of the room, and a single red bike was leant against it. It was sized for a child, and had a small wicker basket filled to its handlebars. I stared at the bike, and for several moments, I was unsure as to why it had grabbed my attention. I quickly realized that it had been Piper's, and she would always ride it around after school and in front of the store on weekends. The tires were still ringed with beige sand, and a half-dressed Barbie doll lay in the bottom of the basket, smiling up at a canopy of grimy spiderwebs. Piper had been a form of advertisement for her parents' shop, in a way, riding a shiny bike around to hopefully entice the other kids. It seemed to work too, and she was always proud to be helping out. I hadn't spoken to her much, but when I did, she was always looking forward to Saturday. I still feel guilty that I barely noticed that she stopped coming to school. A battered cash register sat on the shop's counter, its drawer jutting out from a swift and apparent violent emptying. The counter itself was covered in leaflets advertising the store, and I inspected one fondly. The big blue and orange logo across the top had faded, but it still looked more like its former glory 
than the decaying sign up front. I replaced it on the counter and noticed the corner of another leaflet, different to the others that buried it. I pulled it free and found that someone, at some point, had torn it in half. It was washed out like somebody had got it wet several times over, but some words were still legible. Quality of life was still faintly legible across the bottom, in delicate white script against the black and gold background. I suddenly felt uneasy and gently put it back, smoothing the pile of leaflets to cover it. I remember how cold I felt just then, a dreadful unease that tugged at every follicle on my body. Something flashed in the corner of my vision. It was a landline, a cordless phone that sat in its cradle, and one of the buttons in the base was blinking orange. I pressed it, and a robotic voice spoke through the tinny speaker. New message, received on Tuesday 5th, February 2008. The silent building filled with the gasps and sobs of a woman, her moans of anguish distorted as the feeble speakers tried to convey her suffering. Mike, oh Mike, I, I don't know what to do. She paused and choked back a sob. I was just speaking to her and the machine started going crazy. She was convulsing and... She paused again as a fresh wave of pain bowled up in racking sobs. We can't do anything. She's gonna die and we can't do anything. I can't handle this. Click. She left a deafening silence behind. My ears rang with a memory of her pain still fresh in my mind. The message wasn't intended for me, but whatever it had been about was long over, and that knowledge was all I had to comfort me, if barely at all. I continued my exploration through a door at the back of the room, leading into a short, windowless hallway that extended to the back of the building, turning right to a bathroom and left into a musty kitchenette that stank of old coffee and microwave food. I turned on my torch. This room, unlike the storefront, had been left to rot in its disused squalor. A first aid kit hung agape on the wall, its contents spilled on the floor. I looked over a small, fold-out table that held a few odds and ends, an old checkbook, an overexposed passport photo of the McPhersons, and a messy scrap of paper with the medical center's phone number scrawled in biro. It was then that I heard the footsteps. They moved slowly above me, heavy, deliberate footfalls punctuated by the agonized squeaks and groans of old wooden flooring. Maybe it was my fear, but the darkness seemed to grow thicker in my vision. I strained to hear the footsteps over my heartbeat that now thundered in my ears, but they'd stopped. It was time to leave, I decided. I ducked back out into the hallway, and as I re-entered the storefront, I realized that there were no stairs up to a second floor. I didn't stop to think about it. As far as I cared by then, it was all the more reason to get out. The evening had quickly gathered and it was dark outside now, leaving me little to no light except for my torch, which seemed so much weaker than I remembered. Its paltry light was even weaker for the dusty atmosphere, but it was still strong enough to reflect a flash of red from across the room. The shiny red of a child's bike, slumped in the far corner a beam of light from outside swept across the door, and before I could react, the door flew open and the silhouette of a man blocked my path. I showed my torch in his face, and while it was barely enough to make him flinch, I recognized the face of Mike McPherson. He was a terrible specter of a person, his face haggard and his shoulders slumped. 
He looked at me with hurt in his eyes. Why are you here? He looked at Piper's bicycle in the corner and let out a pained, almost childish cry. It's been moved. It wasn't me, I stammered. He shook his head like he was trying to loosen a voice trapped inside. I know it wasn't you. It was her. It's always her. He stormed towards the bike with his hands out as if to seize it, but the will drained from him in seconds and he slumped to his knees. Everything, he sobbed. My whole life, gone, ruined, dead. Click. New message received on Tuesday 5th, February 2008. No, he screamed. Not again. The distorted message began to play, and Mike rocked on the floor, clutching the bike in his hands. I made for the door, and behind me, a sharp screech from the speakers made me flinch. The message changed. You ignored her. You ignored me. The distortion grew to the noise of a jet engine. Her voice rose into a scream. This is your fault. You killed me. You. I broke into a sprint and fled the building as Mike McPherson sat alone in his grief. Alone, save for the voice of his wife reopening a wound that would never heal. Not over her dead body. I'm done exploring abandoned buildings. A tomb should stay closed. It's a rather mundane job to live and maintain a lighthouse. It's isolating, other than the occasional tourist that want to know the lighthouse's history. I'm not much of a social character, but the history of the building is something I knew well. I'd walk them up the steps while regaling tales of the ships the lighthouse safely guided to shore, and eventually they'd reach the top and get that view. The same view that pulled me from my living quarters every morning. Heat would radiate against my knuckles from the cup of coffee I'd take small sips from as I watched the expansive blue horizon. I'd spent a number of years in the lighthouse, calling it my home. Maintaining the lighthouse itself was easy to work. The difficult part came from adjusting to a new lifestyle. If I wanted or needed electricity, I'd had to crank a generator, and you can forget about things like accessing the internet or taking a nice hot bath. The horizon always kept me trapped there though, like waves of Stockholm Syndrome crashed against the rocks. Occasionally, I'd even get to witness an approaching vessel guided by the building's light. Sometimes, I'd even get a blow of the ship's horn, a kind of thank you. The water can be harsh though, and some nights, I would ponder on the ships that weren't able to see my lights. Even though I no longer maintain that lighthouse, I wonder still. I was a vigilant worker when it came to keeping the light operating. It wasn't much work as I said before, but it was important and a slip up would cast the sea into darkness. There was only one night where I drifted off listening to the raging storm that the light bulb burnt out without my noticing. I couldn't tell you how long the light was out for, but upon waking up surrounded by complete darkness, I quickly gathered the needed supplies and headed to the light. When the light buzzed back to life and cast its gaze upon the violent sea and its whipping winds, I could see a small glimmer on the ground by the edge of the cliff. During harsher storms, the waves would smack up against the rocks and jettison into the air bringing debris with them. Every time the light passed over the spot, the glint would catch my eye, almost like it was calling out to me. 
It was going to drive me nuts thinking about it if I just left it until the storm died down. So, I threw on my heavier clothing and went to investigate. Rain pelted me as I walked towards the glimmer, and the winds did their best to persuade me from my advance. Against the weather's better wishes, I reached the edge of the cliff and looked for the object that had been calling for me. As the light passed over again, I could see a dark object surrounded by tall, swaying grass. Picking it up, the wind almost knocking me on my feet as I bent over, I was able to recognize it immediately. It was a phone. One of those old rotary ones that you have to spin for the number you want. Despite crashing into the side of the cliff with the powerful waters, it felt like it was in pristine condition. In complete awe, I headed back to the lighthouse to get a better look at the new treasure. I'd seen a plethora of oddities wash up with the crashing of the waves. Things like boating supplies were commonplace, but every so often, something more obscure would wash up. The phone was by far the oddest thing I had seen, at the time at least. Getting into the lighthouse, I turned a small overhead light powered by batteries on. Running my fingers along its cool and black surface, I looked for a port for the landline, but found no such opening. The black metal stretched the overhead light into lines on its surface. I hadn't seen many of these phones made of metal. As I thought of its origins, a rumble was sent through my body, radiating from my hands. I couldn't decipher it until I realized that the damn phone was ringing. Its chime was slow and faded, like running a wet stick across a gated fence, as though the phone was still underwater. Taking my hands off the phone in my lap, they continued to shake, but they shook in trepidation. Minutes passed as the phone continued to ring, and light poured in from out of the room. Once I had just about enough, I reached down in one swift movement, picking up the phone and placed it up to my ear. Before I had time to copulate a thought and convince my mouth to move, I heard a female voice. Is anyone out there? Her words were desperate and soaked in fear. I could hear the storm around her and the clanking of metal hitting wood. This is Vessel C, Elvis. Can anyone hear me? She continued. My lips were trembling as I attempted to voice a response. I, I can hear you. I felt regret as the words slipped out and I came to terms with how bizarre it all was. As she explained the situation to me, excited that she was able to reach someone, I toted up the phone up the stairs. I... I don't see you out there, Elvis. I replied to her, please. The beam of light swept across the dark sea, revealing nothing but white caps and a torrent of rain. I'm here! She screamed into the phone. Her voice was choppy and delicate, with a feeling of sorrow that only those facing their end can muster. Frantically, I searched the horizon, with a telescope attached to the lighthouse guardrail. Still, nothing. My damn dress is stuck, she cried. Just calm down, okay? Try to get loose. I'm looking for you. I completely forgot at that point that I was talking into an unconnected phone that I found on the cliff face. All I could feel was a soft ball-sized pain in my chest as her words, carried by the waves, crashed into me. I'm sinking. I can't get loose. Oh God, help me. It's so cold. Please. I don't see you, I whispered out through pained lips 
my head shaking as her words became more muffled in distance as the sounds of rushing water closed in. I don't... My words were far too hard to swallow. The rain smacked under the plastic covering the top of the lighthouse. Small beads of water running down causing streaks of liquid. I could feel them on my cheeks as the phone gave a click before switching to silence. Reaching up, my thumb swept away the tears pooling under my eyelids. After standing in silence, watching the waters for any sign of life until my feet ached for rest, I returned to my living quarters and sat on my bed. I kept the phone on my lap, looking it over again and again. Then, it rang out once more. With much hesitation, I lifted the handset off the receiver and placed it to my ear. Hello? I whispered. It's cold. The woman's voice came through the phone like a thick liquid, her calm voice pouring into my ears. It's so cold, she repeated. The words cascaded into my nervous system, creating a prickling sensation wherever they landed. I couldn't do anything but sit completely stunned by her re-emergence. It was hard to keep the receiver still against my ear. Where are you? Are you safe? I asked, stuttering through my words like I had been handed a script for the first time. It's much deeper than you think. Her voice was cold and robotic, like she had been saying the same lines every day of her life. You wouldn't believe what I see down here. The words started to take on a more vicious tone. An air of anger could be felt from the other side of the phone. Come and join us, was the last line she spoke before I slammed the receiver down and tossed the phone across the room, causing a crash of metal. The phone had fallen in such a way that the receiver was facing towards the ceiling and from it. I could hear a faint whistling, like a siren call. The noise must have soothed something within my fears, because I found myself laying onto the bed and drifting off to sleep. Dreams of the ocean throwing me into its depths, giving me as a tribute to the beast that rests below, filled my night, until I awoke to the sound of a phone ringing. Like an alarm, the same faded and wet mockery of a ringtone echoed throughout my living quarters. More angry than anything, I shot out of bed and picked up the black phone, placing the receiver to my mouth. I shouted, You listen here! The words caught up in the middle of my throat, as I could still hear the ringing noise, despite having picked up the phone. Come and join us. Her voice, smooth and haunting, slipped through the patterned small holes in the receiver. The phone thunked onto the hardwood. I left the room and began to climb the stairwell to the top, with the ringing still running through the old building. I reached the top and looked over the horizon again, to find nothing but clear skies and quelled waters. When I looked down at the cliff, however, I knew I couldn't justify my employment any longer. Scattered about, surrounded by the tall and vibrant green grass, a couple dozen black phones, their chorus of rings calling out to me. I am no longer living at that lighthouse. I quickly gathered my things and found another place to stay. As I'm sure you can imagine, I have a hard time shaking that noise from my head. It's what comes to me whenever a room is too silent. A distant ringing is there whenever I shut my eyes, and when I'm trying to sleep at night, I swear I can feel waves crashing against me. 
It's been almost a month since I walked away from that place, but I still remember where it is and no matter where I sleep, the ringing and the waves are calling me back home. There's a reason you don't find much life underground. Sure, a wolf might take shelter in a cave during a nasty storm. The occasional moth might venture into unknown caverns. But wolves and moths are not true cave dwellers. True cave dwellers are what the Greeks called troglodytes, meaning any animal living entirely underground, never leaving. So seldom do these creatures see light that most troglodytes are born completely blind. Take, for instance, the cave fish or the cave wolf spider. Not only are both blind, but they have no eyes at all. Just pale flesh stretched over where their eyes should be. Joining them are whole hosts of various crawling insects, all blind, yet in their dark home, all seeing. Where they dwell, there's no need for vision. The darkness protects them and keeps them hidden. These creatures know exactly the moment humans descend upon the bedrock with our bright lights and clumsy footing. We don't belong down there, yet in some instances, it may become impossible to leave. My name is Blake Doran, and two weeks ago, I made the worst decision of my life. One I'll have to live with forever. The night started like any other. Dad was away for business. Mom left a few years ago, so it was just my brother Nathan and I. Nate is not a lot older, but his personality is the exact opposite of mine. He's an Eagle Scout, while I quit Cub Scouts years ago as a Webelo. He's the daredevil adventurer. I'm the champion of the high school's chess club. I love my brother, but with Nate, it's always a challenge to prove myself somehow. Usually, I ignore his taunts, but that night, he was extra persistent, calling me the delicate web low, allergic to the outdoors. He was getting under my skin, and I was bored, so out of some stupid insecurity, I agreed to play along. Earlier that week, he had taken his metal detector, a gift from dad, to an old ghost town about five miles out of town. I was hoping he would bring back some long lost antiques. Instead, he told me about a cavern in the foothills. He had almost fallen down the entrance, which was just a hole in the ground, about five feet wide and concealed by pine shrubs. Ever since dad left that morning, he was pestering me about climbing down the cavern chimney to explore. By evening, I relented, and we were packed and ready to go less than an hour later. We took Dad's old Ford pickup. Once we got to the outskirts of town, Nate pulled onto an old dirt road, cutting through the desert into the foothills. We parked on the base of the first hill, and from there, it was a two-mile hike. Beyond the hill was a narrow gorge, running along a dried up creek. The valley used to be a thriving hub for prospectors and gold miners back in the 1800s. In its heyday, this was one of the largest towns in New Mexico. But today, it's a forgotten relic of the past, with most of the old frontier buildings torn down or decayed. We walked past a few crumbling bricks and adobe foundations and crossed the withered stream bed. The darkness was intimidating, with a new moon hidden in the sky and thick charcoal clouds drooping low to meet a howling gust of wind. The chill penetrated through our fleece caving jumpsuits. The gorge took a steep bend as we walked around another hill. Nate stopped, trying to remember his path from the week before. I remember this bend, we're close now. Nate's eyes darted along the slanted slopes on our left. 
It's somewhere up here. How did you even manage to find the cavern? I asked. Nate looked at me and flashed a toothy grin. Bats. Bats? Yeah, you know, black fuzzy winged creatures. Live in the caves, come out at night to eat insects. I saw a colony and figured they lived nearby. Did they not teach you about bats and cub scouts were below? I rolled my eyes and scanned the cloudy haze above us. No way we'll see any bats tonight. Ah, who needs bats when you have a big brother as a guide? He rustled my hair with his icy knuckle. Come on, Blake. This will be fun. Either way, I muttered while fixing my hair. We left the rocky gorge behind and climbed north. There was no trail, so we cut through the thickets of pinyon and juniper shrubs. The hilltop was surprisingly flat, with steep drop-offs on the opposite side. Dense pockets of bushes dotted the landscape, but Nate managed to retrace his steps and find the entrance. Nate grasped a handful of branches to reveal the rocky throat of the cavern. He picked up a nearby rock with his other hand and threw it in the dark chasm, creating a fading melody of stone ricocheting against stone. Nate threw down our backpacks and unpacked while I stood on the edge of the seemingly endless drop. Rain fell from the low hanging clouds. We never accounted for weather, and even though it was a light drizzle, I felt wholly unprepared for the task ahead. Seeing the vertical drop up close, its rocks slick with fresh rain brought forth a harsh chill of reality. I had never been caving before. I didn't even rock climb. Nate knew this, but I could see him unpacking regardless. Better strap in. We came all the way out here. There's no backing out now. Oh, come on, Nate. It's dark, and I don't want to slip. We'll come back in the morning. And what? Hope the sun starts shining underground? It'll be dark regardless, buddy. He took a step forward and put his arm around me. You know my old scoutmaster, Dylan Cooper's dad? He served three tours in Afghanistan, searching cave after cave for terrorists. Well, guess who taught me everything I know about splunking? That's nice. Go splunk with Mr. Cooper. Nate frowned, but kept his arms around me. You're missing the point. I found this place, and the first person I thought to tell was you. We fight all the time. Can you blame me if I want to help you do something new and exciting before I leave? Fine, enough already. I shook his arm off my shoulder and continued. But whenever I say leave, we leave, okay? Of course, we go in, take a look around and right back out. He seems genuinely happy, and for a moment, I felt guilty about the whole thing. I knew he was moving away for college soon, but I never acknowledged the impact of him leaving. With dad's work travel, home without Nate just seemed lonely and bleak. Nate gave an amused look as I stepped into my harness. The fabric an intense shade of fire engine red clamped around my waist in a tight hug. That used to be mine, you know, before I bought this bad boy. He motioned towards his full body army camo harness. The built-in waist belt and crossing chest straps made him look like a paratrooping marine. Say what you want about Nate's over-eagerness, but he did come prepared. We had headlights, flashlights, Repel racks for descending, ascenders to get back up, and a 300 foot rope Nate had to special order. He thought the length was overkill, but better to be safe than sorry, especially since we had no idea how deep the cave floor was. Nate told me he searched all the forums online, but there was no mention of any caverns in the area. He said we were explorers, navigating uncharted lands. While he anchored the rope to a nearby pine, I stared down rows of sharp, protruding stone. My stomach turned uneasily 
and my legs wobbled. A strange sense of pure fascination overtook me. A scientific zeal to leap through this jagged portal. The shape of the pit seemed to morph and swell, and I soon realized I no longer heard the drizzle of rain or the mating cries of the desert cicadas. The sunken cavity seemed to drown out all unearthly noise. Blake! The sound of Nate's voice broke my trance. The rope's ready, let's get you hooked up. With just one rope, we had to descend one at a time. Nate insisted I go first so he could talk me through the steps. He fed the rope through the rack of my harness. This is your braking system, okay? If you want to slow down, thread the rope around these bars to create friction. Take them out to speed up. You got it? I nodded, gulping down saliva and hanging onto his every word. I turned my back to the cavern and started my descent, maintaining a tight grip on the rope. Nate's booming instructions echoed clearly enough, but his outline and the cloudy night sky faded from view as I got deeper. For the first time that night, I felt alone. The surrounding rock walls closed in on me as the pathway constricted. The wet rocks left a cold imprint every time my back grazed against stone. I've never been claustrophobic, but I felt stuck. Earth had swallowed me whole, and I was clogging its arteries. My eyes closed as I breathed in clammy, stale air. The endless dribble of water created a rich symphony as I fell down jagged rocks to the dark cavern floor below. The rope I strangled was wet. Everything was wet. I opened my eyes to see darkness overpower the fading ray of Nate's light. Keep going, you're almost there! Nate's voice thundered down like an angel from the heavens. I placed my boots on the slippery rock and continued my descent. I was making progress, despite my lingering sensation of being slowly digested in a pit. I must have been at least 200 feet down when the chimney transformed into a large, cavernous room. While my lights could only illuminate a fraction of the space, the room appeared immeasurable. Bellowing echoes rose from the rapid drip, drip, plop of water hitting limestone. As I made my final descent, I wondered how Nate would react to the sheer size of the chamber. The place could fill a football stadium with room to spare. My boots landed on the rock floor with a thump. I tried to walk my weak legs out of numbness, then unhooked the rope from my harness and tugged on what little rope we had left. A faint shout responded from above. I walked on wobbly legs to explore my immediate surroundings while I waited for Nate to make his long climb down. Towering formations spread about the chamber. Limestone stalagmites rose from the cave floor like ancient monuments, yet these were dwarfed by one colossal spherical column with long strings of rock hanging from the front. The stalagmite resembled a bearded man with hollow eyes glaring down. The more I studied it, the more inhuman it appeared, until it no longer looked like a man, but something closer to a squid or an alien elephant with three trunks dangling from its narrow face. Cold air ran up my arms as I walked into the vast and endless darkness. My breathing became heavy, and I inhaled some musty, spoiled air. A rotting odour was stuck in my tongue, and I covered my mouth. It smelled like roadkill, the smell of death. It didn't take long to find the source, even with my cheap headlight. A decomposing grey wolf was lying in a shallow puddle of nearby water. I looked towards the rocky slope I had rappelled down and realised the cause of death. Poor guy must have never seen the gap with all those bushes. It was a grim thought, 
One moment you're walking through pine shrubs, next you're falling feet first in darkness, smashing against sharp rocky teeth until you land in this subterranean cemetery. Despite the rancid smell, I pushed on, stepping over the rotting lobo and something else. The path became coarse and uneven, and I didn't stop until I heard a sharp, piercing crunch from beneath my right foot. I lifted my foot and picked up three long, white fragments which resembled a branch at first, but rough and porous. The bones fell from my hand and dropped on the cave floor with a soft clack. There was no way to know what animal it was. The bones were old, perhaps ancient, completely calcified with age. There were more white shards ahead, clumped together like clusters of broken seashells you would find along the beach. Except, these were no seashells, and worse, they were accumulated farther ahead, with each new pool of faded porcelain larger. The bones were more whole, more preserved. I moved my light to a new pile, and time seemed to slow. I couldn't move, except for my eyes, which were scanning the objects before me. I was looking at a skull, a human skull, with a gaping hole an inch above the right eye cavity. New objects came into view. I counted at least four arrowheads, a blunt wooden club, clay pottery shards, and some large circular beads. Beyond that was a second skeleton with a shattered leg and outstretched arms. Just out of reach was a broken whiskey bottle. A scream pierced the dark, followed by a booming thud. Nate! I ran as fast as I could, calling for my brother in gasping shouts, but there was no response. I tried to retrace my steps back to the landing spot, but I soon realized I was lost. I scanned the stalagmites ahead, but there was no sign of the elephant-like behemoth I spotted earlier. Nothing looked familiar. It made no sense. I was sure I had not ventured far. I continued my mad dash and sensed movement from the corner of my eyes. My heart jumped as I looked back to see a figure walking in the opposite direction. I recognized the jumpsuit right away. It was Nate. What the hell happened, Nate? He stopped walking and turned around, raised his hand to shield his eyes from my light. Blake? He was dragging the heavy climbing rope behind him, still connected to his harness. How far did you fall? I don't know. He paused, struggling to put his words together. I remember... The rope was loose. Rain must have screwed with my knot. I tried to hold onto the edge, but never got my footing. I took his shattered headlight off and examined his head. His hair was slick with sweat and dirt, but no bump. He was disoriented, but otherwise unscathed. Are you hurt? He paused to examine his palms. I feel fine. Let's get some more light. He unclipped the rope from his harness and tossed me one of two flashlights he had dangling from his belt. I grasped the cheap plastic flashlight and turned it on. Nate, how exactly do we get out of here with no rope? He sighed and shook his head. We'll find a way. A lot of these caverns have multiple entrances but we climbed down nearly 300 feet and... Don't you think I know that? Just trust me, okay? I'll find a way out. Yeah, well, there's something I should show you first. I motioned for him to follow, and we walked back towards the bony graveyard. Something reeks, Nate said. 
I pointed my light to the dead wolf. Nate covered his nose and bent down to observe its black eyes. Come on, there's more. More of what? He said with a grimace. I carried my light back to the cracked skull surrounded by Indian artifacts. Is that a... A human skull, I answered. You see the hole on top? You don't get a head injury like that from falling. He was hit. Hard. By who? Other Indians? Settlers? Who knows? I'm not sure how old these are. The Indian skull could be hundreds of years old, if not more. I turned to a more preserved skeleton near the shattered bottle. Mr. Whiskey here is not looking too bad, all things considered. I paused to inspect the artifacts. There were more arrowheads, clubs, and broken, rusted axes, all near human remains. Everything else was just jumbled heaps of dust and bone. There's something funny about this place, I said. It's all too convenient. What do you mean? There's a whole warehouse of supplies just sitting here. Stuff that most people wouldn't carry on them. Maybe one of the corpses was a trader. Possibly. Or well, this place could have been a type of jail or confinement for the local tribes to throw away troublemakers. Wait, Nate said, pointing at the cracked skull. Why would they bash his head in? It's not a jail if every prisoner is dead. Unless they let someone else make the final blow. What if they brought more than one prisoner down at a time and left them here, surrounded by all these weapons and limited food supply? I pointed my light to a clump of fabric. That could have been a blanket before it started to decompose. The handler back there is from a buck. A big one too. He didn't just fall. He was dinner. A fight to the death. Some theory you got there, Nate said, his voice cracking at the end. A chill wind came through as goosebumps formed rough patches in my arms. I thought of my warm bed and had an undeniable sensation I shouldn't be in this rocky death pit. I started to tell Nate we should be looking for a way to leave, but he raised a finger and shushed me. As he stared in the darkness, I heard it. The first moan, off in the distance, quiet and subdued. That's not an animal, Nate said. Don't freak out, it's the cavern playing tricks on us. I read about these types of things. The water drips into hollow crevices in the rock, and the sound echoes back to us. Okay, Mr. Geologist, but to me, this sounds human. Like a kid or a woman crying. It's so subtle it could be anything, Nate. I was trying to be calm, but I didn't realize I had become to raise my voice as well. We made our way towards where we thought the source of the moaning was. My headlight was pale and somber, his batteries draining by the minute. With Nate's light damaged from the fall, he had to use one of the backup flashlights as his sole light source. The moaning returned, this time louder than before. Without hesitating, Nate bolted in a sprint. I followed, pumping my sore arms and legs into motion. I was panting, but determined to keep up with the bouncing beam from Nate's light. The last thing I wanted was to be separated again. I hurdled over a rock, stumbled, and nearly ran into Nate. What is it? I demanded in gasping breaths. He turned to me, but had no answer. I pushed him aside to get a better look, and froze. It was a boy maybe six or seven years old, wearing a navy blue and red striped shirt. He was sitting on a rock in the middle of a small pool with his back to us, oblivious to our presence. His feet kicked the shallow water below as he emitted a high-pitched cry. Nate looked to me and took a few steps forward, clearing his throat. Hey kid, 
Are you hurt? The boy continued his wailing, not reacting at all to Nate's voice. Nate continued his advance and placed a shaking hand on the boy's shoulder, repeating his question. The boy jumped and fell hands first into the water. I lunged forward to help, but he crawled away, keeping his distance in the cloudy, dark water. I looked at Nate. He shrugged and turned to ask another question, but the boy was gone, replaced by a trail of water. We followed, calling out for him, until we reached the end of the main chamber. Before us was a narrow passage, about five feet tall. We ducked our heads and continued. Water seemed to ooze out of the rocks and onto the floor, concealing the boy's trail. After a few minutes, we reached an intersection. One path on our right continued uphill, the other to our left followed a steep downhill slope. While we deliberated, the boy's low sobbing echoed down, and we rushed uphill. The tangled trail took several sharp turns around bends, never quite staying a straight path. After a few hundred feet, we found ourselves in a small, dead-end room. A slew of sharp calcite stalactites drooped from the low ceiling in soda straw formation, like hundreds of thin icicles dangling a foot from my head. The boy was bending over something we couldn't see. Near him was the pile of large rocks that fell from an overhead ledge above. The sheer quantity of rock and loose dirt made it look like a cave-in. What happened to him? said the boy. Nate approached, flashlight in hand, and I followed. The boy turned to face us, his eyes red and puffy from tears. He was bending over the body of a young boy, lying face down, feet crushed by several small boulders. The corpse was rotten and decayed, dirty, thin rags soaked in blood wrapped around his back. We stepped closer, inch by inch, to discover they were not rags, but a deteriorated cotton shirt with navy blue and red stripes. Nate dropped his flashlight and stepped back. The boy jumped from his position and held out his hands. Wait, don't leave. He wiped his congested nose with a finger and looked right at me. What's wrong? Please don't leave. I choked to my words, struggling to get something, anything out. The boy, still sniffling, followed my eyes to the corpse behind him, and then at his own shirt, his mouth contorted into a wide gasp. Tears welled in his eyes, and he started to shriek. Hundreds of needle-sharp stalactites above swayed to the howling of the boy. He began to fidget and squirm, as if he was having a seizure, until the convulsion stopped, and with a trance-like, placid face, he started chanting. Never again the light of day. He repeated that one line while walking out into the dark tunnels with no light. Blood rushed to my cheeks, and I locked my eyes with Nate. Is this some prank of yours? The rope breaking, your miraculous survival, the dead kid, some sick joke to prove how big of a man you are? Well... Nate looked at me with pleading eyes, eyes that gave a resounding no. Then we need to leave now. He stood there, shaking his head. Not without the boy. Forget about the damn kid. We need to move these rocks. This could be a collapsed exit, a way out. I can clear the rocks much faster. You take the flashlight and bring him back. Nate! We won't leave him. Go to the main room, where we first found him. I let out an audible grunt, grabbed the flashlight from Nate's belt, and ran back down the tunnel. By the time I returned to the main chamber, my cold sweat had turned into a feverish soak. Impenetrable darkness seemed to swarm around me as my headlight dimmed into obscure flickers of fading light. 
I piled on the flashlight and called for the boy in asthmatic shouts. I scoured as much of the boundless room as I could, but I took a sharp turn, lost my footing, and slammed my head against the heap of rocks. I woke, lying face down, drooling on cold limestone. I don't know how long I was out, but the sweat on my forehead had dried, replaced with a swollen, pulsing bump below a shattered headlight. My flashlight was still on, sitting about five feet from where I fell. There was a dull pain in my head, and a high-pitched ringing in my ears. Dragging footsteps shuffled off in the distance, moving in a wide circle around me. Nate! Like the light in my hands, my voice was shaky. I didn't know whether to shout at the top of my lungs or whisper in hushed tones. It wasn't Nate's voice that greeted me, but the raspy, short-winded wheeze of some unseen, dying animal. Its dank, sweltering breath right outside my left ear whispered, Come back in dark, this way. I sprang to my feet and fled in the opposite direction. With each stride, it grew darker. I reached for my flashlight, but my hands grasped onto nothing. I couldn't think. My mind was barren from the icy pang of pain. I continued to run out of pure impulse until I found myself cornered. My flashlight was lying on the ground about 20 feet away. The light was distorted like a firefly extinguishing every few seconds. It would appear, first as a speck, then a sliver of light, enough to illuminate a moving shadow. Something was standing in front of the light. The light returned in full as the shadow retreated in the darkness. At that moment, something lifted my flashlight. I couldn't see anything but the levitating light, carried by shuffled footsteps that were closing in fast. Paralysis overtook me. Anxiety strangled out instincts. I searched for any angle to escape, but the shadow was too close. With eyes closed and ears covered by icy cold hands, I prayed. I prayed this was all a side effect of a concussion, that Nate was out there doing one of his amateur pranks. But I sensed growing light approaching footsteps, rotting breath on my face. I clenched my gut, and my eyes opened to nothing. There was nothing, not even my flashlight. Whether it was luck or delusion, I don't know, but I escaped, wandering the darkness, hand outstretched, reaching for any obstacle in my way. Eventually, I spotted light, my missing flashlight, abandoned near our detached rope and climbing equipment. I had finally reached the chimney we climbed down. For the first time since leaving Nate, I felt hope rushing in. I could salvage the equipment and use the light to return to Nate, who might have found the little boy. But there was something else, shrouded behind the pile of rope. I reached for the light and let out a gasp. Nate's body was lying in a pool of blood, his body mangled. His body was ice cold with no pulse. Blood flowed from a large crack in his skull and a shattered shin bone tore clean through his skin. I sat there, sobbing while cradling my brother, refusing to let go. I felt something tap my shoulder and locked eyes with Nate, perfectly healthy, not a scrape or gash on him. His grim eyes travelled to the body behind me, his body. He had the same dazed expression the boy had shown earlier. Never again the light of day, come back in dark this way, you wake deep below burial ground. As Nate continued his trance-like chanting, the drumming of loud footsteps approached. From out the darkness, the boy ran to embrace me. 
His nervous fidgeting was almost rat-like, and as he spoke, he choked on his words. Where am I? Why am I down here? I opened my mouth to speak, but Nate started chanting a new line. You will come back around. I looked at the chanting clone of my brother and to the bloodied body behind me and felt light-headed. The walls of the chamber were closing in around me, trapping and suffocating me in the darkness. I did what I thought was my only option left. I grabbed the flashlight and ran as fast as I could until I reached the collapsed cavern entrance. I heaved the rocks away, starting with the small boulders near the boy's corpse and moving onto the overhead ledge where most of the rocks remained. Behind me, I heard my brother's echoing voice cry out, You can't leave me in here! My hands, swollen and red, worked at a surprising pace. Despite a feeble numbing sensation, overpowering each and every limb. Tunnel vision set in as I clawed away at the rocks until I felt, for the first time in hours, a gush of cold wind burst through a small gap. My lungs took their fill of fresh air as I cleared the last few rocks standing between me and the whistling cicadas outside. Every part of me wanted to crawl out right then and there, but I hesitated and turned to face Nate and the boy. Both stood below the edge. They begged for me to stay and help. I'll never forget those faces. Never have I seen such a look of pure dread on Nate's face, but in those moments he looked like my big brother rather than the robotic, chanting version of Nate. And the boy... I can't even begin to explain how wrong it felt to see a kid so broken, so helpless, but with no hope. Tears streamed down my eyes as I yelled out, Nate, if you're really there, follow me home. For the briefest of moments, I convinced myself Nate would climb out and together we would walk home. Nate would crack his jokes, teasing me for believing his ploy but the face I was looking at was not laughing, not even a smirk. They would not follow me, even if they wanted to. The whispers and moans returned, forming a haunting, animalistic harmony that amplified to a crescendo. While three figures emerged from behind Nate and the boy, the things were human, yet severely deformed. Thin, albino skin stretched over arching hunchbacks, while massive veins bulging under the skin glowed an eerie green. Three pairs of empty eye sockets stared back at me, black and empty as the cave they occupied. The largest of the three let out a guttural roar and advanced, placing his hands on the prisoners. Nate and the boy collapsed, and the disfigured creatures dragged them into the darkness beyond. I squirmed through the small opening, and found myself in a familiar, small gulch near the foot of the hill. I stacked the pile of rocks to reseal the exit, and begun the lonely walk back to the car. To my surprise, the first light of dawn was emerging in the night sky. I estimated I was in the cave for over seven hours. A flock of bats returning from the night's hunt swarmed overhead and congregated at the top of the hill. With all that had happened to me, I remember obsessing over those bats. Did they answer to whoever or whatever controls the caverns? Or are they victims as well, their home corrupted by some perverse colony of subterrestrial beasts? I managed to find the car, and while I didn't have a license, I knew enough from watching Nate and Dad drive to get home. I pulled into the driveway then walked into the empty house and cried. I grasped my phone in my sweaty hands and dialed Dad's number. Our call was tense and short. He booked the first flight back from New Mexico, and later that day, I told him face to face that Nate was missing. I didn't mention anything that happened after Nate fell. 
I didn't want him processing anything beyond arranging search parties for Nate. I could barely process the prior night's events. How was I supposed to tell him everything? All I know is Nate's body is down there, along with something who looks exactly like Nate. After a week and a half of searching every known cave in the area, the search party was called off. I tried to lead everyone to the cavern, but I couldn't remember how to get there. It's as if my memories are being torn from me, overtaken by a lingering sensation that a part of me I need in my life is missing. Like trying to run with no lungs, with every inhale of air passing right through me. Whatever is wrong with me, it's getting worse with each passing day. So in case I don't make it back, I wrote down everything I remember about our descent into those moaning caverns. Yes, I'm going back for Nate. Dad can't look me in the eyes for more than a few passing seconds. He doesn't look at me the same way anymore. And when I lay in bed and reflect, I know part of him, a part he's trying to suppress, blames me for losing Nate. If there's a chance Nate is still out there, I'm going to look for him. While I don't know how to get there, I'm starting to recall more. For the past few nights, I've been having reoccurring dreams where I'm walking, not willingly, but walking toward the cavern in a paralyzed trance, unable to stop until I reach the collapsed exit. I remove rocks until I can see only pitch black. Yet, in these dreams, I sense life, a frenzy of activity tucked away in the darkness. I sense Nate, the boy, and dozens of others trapped in the dire dungeon. Then, like a scourge of lightning in the night sky, the chamber lights up in a greenish glow, and I see myself, only the back of my head, when enough to know it's me, starved and alone. As the green light fades to black, I hear a gravelly voice calling for me to return before I wake up, to return to find the missing part of me I left behind. The voice moans and beckons his call, again and again. I can now officially say that I live in the New York City. I finally made the move from Brooklyn to Manhattan, a major milestone for every young professional that I've been looking forward to for years. It's an almost formulaic experience. Your rent doubles, there's no real way around that, but you get a dishwasher, a short commute, and the feeling that you have, in fact, finally made it. My new room is about a third of what I had size-wise in Brooklyn, which would be depressing were it not for the gigantic windows. They're nearly floor to ceiling, let in so much natural light and are arguably reason enough to justify the rent increase. The one minor downside is that there's construction going on outside my window. The units adjacent to mine are being expanded, and so there are workers out there pretty much all day, every day. I wasn't too worried about it. In fact, I hadn't even realized the construction until I was rummaging, naked, through a suitcase to find clean underwear after my first shower there. I'd heard clanking outside and realized there were a host of construction workers not three yards from my nude self. To their credit, if they'd noticed at all, they weren't paying any attention to me. Those men, I reckoned, had probably seen all sorts of things. Still, I snatched the towel, wrapped it around myself and drawn the blinds quickly. And after that, I was always careful to check outside before changing. Moments of nudity were my only reason to draw the blinds though. That sunlight was a luxury and I intended to soak up as much of it as possible. That had been my intent anyway. Things have changed a bit since then. It began several weeks ago. I was eating in bed when I noticed an unusual disruption in the light pouring over my quilt. 
I glanced to the window, and nearly choked my sandwich. One of the construction workers was standing, quite still, just inches from my window. It would not have been so startling, if not for the fact that he was facing into my apartment. I shouted at the construction worker, threw a pillow at the glass. He didn't move, didn't budge. His unblinking eyes stared blankly forward, a hint of a smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. Pervert. Had he been watching me eat? Sleep? I ran a mental scan to see if I'd been nude, done anything compromising that afternoon. How long had he been there? I shouted again. No change in his posture, and bizarrely, no reaction from his co-workers. Enraged, I slammed on the glass with a clenched fist, hoping to startle him off. The man remained unmoving, smile unchanged, eyes forward. I pulled out my phone, glancing down to text my roommate. When I looked up, the construction worker was staring directly at me. Naturally, I freaked out, dropping my phone and darting out of the room. One of my new roommates was in the kitchen. Upon telling her about the stranger, she rushed into my room, phone at the ready. I stayed in the kitchen. She came back a moment later. There's no one out there. He was just there. I pushed past her back into my room. The leering construction worker was indeed gone. What the hell? I scanned the workers in the area. No sign of him. Maybe off on lunch? My roommate offered before leaving the room. Look, I've got an appointment at one, so I'm headed out, but text me if he comes back. I told her I would. He didn't come back for the rest of the day, but when I opened my eyes the next morning, he was there. Same pose, same posture but this time, standing about a foot to the left. Closer, I realized, to the head of my bed. I called the front desk, the concierge as they call it, and they sent someone up to investigate. I didn't take my eyes off of the man. All I could hear was my own breathing and heartbeat. I was so focused that I nearly jumped out of my skin with the doorbell rang. He was tall and broad, and hopefully would pose a more intimidating presence than my 5 foot 4 frame could. I led him to my bedroom, only to find that once again, the watching man was gone. I apologized profusely to Jay, who was incredibly kind about it, and told me not to hesitate to call again if the man came back. The third time it happened, I called the concierge once more. They contacted the construction company, letting me know that I should be hearing from them in two to three business days regarding the matter. This was on a Thursday, so I knew I'd have to contend with a watching man for the entire weekend before hearing from them. And so, we established a pattern. The watching man and I, while I waited on the construction company's call. Every day, first thing in the morning, he would show up, each day a half hour earlier than the day before. I knew this because I'd stopped sleeping, which made it far easier to track his schedule. Each day he moved closer to the head of my bed, at first in increments of a foot or so, and then in distances of six inches, three inches, one. And each time I brought another person into the room, he would be gone. I began trying to trick him. I'd sleep on the couch. I'd hide a friend behind me upon entering to try and catch him off guard. Nothing worked. He was, somehow, outsmarting me each and every time. On Tuesday morning, I received a call from the construction company. They interviewed me extensively. This situation was bizarre in many ways, they told me. My description of the watching man did not match the profiles of any workers assigned to the site. 
Stranger still, they were only supposed to be five men working on the building. The watching man, however, would mean there were six. They promised to send someone over the following morning. In the meantime, they requested I take whatever photos or videos I could of him. They were very, very sorry I had to deal with this. That's what they told me anyway. That afternoon, I prepared to film the watching man on my iPhone. I knew he was there, yet my stomach still dropped as I readied myself to enter my room. Worried that he would disappear if he noticed he was being filmed, I hit record outside of my bedroom, and then pressed the phone to my chest, trying to adopt a casual posture to suggest I wasn't filming or using my phone at all. And so, I walked into my room, camera running, right up to the watching man, emboldened by the knowledge that I was collecting irrefutable evidence of his presence. I pulled a stool over so I could elevate myself to his level, force him to look me in the eyes, which he hadn't done since that first day. I climbed up on the stool, bracing myself. I looked into his vacant eyes. Slowly, slowly, they began to focus in on me, like a camera lens finding its subject. His smile grew bigger, his eyes wider, and then he slammed his entire body against the glass, arms outstretched, flattened as though spread eagled across the windshield of a vehicle that had hit him dead on. I screamed and toppled off my stool, tripping over myself in haste to get out of the room. I slammed my door behind me and dashed out of the apartment, breathing only once the elevator doors had sealed shut, speeding me down towards the lobby. I pulled out my phone, still recording, and hit stop. I restarted the video to watch what evidence I had captured. I watched the recording in its entirety twice. The quality was clear and crisp, and, up until I had fallen, my hand had kept my phone steady against my chest, providing a vantage point that looked almost like it had been shot through my own eyes. It would have been perfect it should have been perfect. But the video recording didn't show anyone on the other side of the glass. The construction company followed up the next evening. The person they'd sent over hadn't been able to locate the watching man. And without any legitimate footage from me, there was nothing more they could do. They didn't know what to tell me. That's what they said anyway. It's been three weeks since I first saw the watching man. I'm relieved to say I've figured out something of a solution. I just keep my blinds closed now, always. I do miss the sunlight, but at least with the blinds closed, all I can see is a silhouette.